Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, February 3rd, we discuss the FDIC, who runs the FDIC in a new administration. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have an excellent panel moderated by Mr. Brian Johnson, who, whom I'll introduce very briefly. Brian is a partner in Austin and Bird's Financial Services and Products Group and the Consumer Financial Services team. He formerly served as Deputy Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and he's currently a member of the Federalist Society's Financial Services and E-Commerce Practice Group Executive Committee, which is sponsoring the event this afternoon. After our speakers give opening remarks, we will turn to audience questions towards the end of the program. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and you can enter those questions at any time. With that, thank you for being with us today. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Evelyn, and thanks as well to Wayne Abernathy for his leadership and his role uh, in bringing um, us together today for this event. It's my pleasure to serve as today's moderator. We are blessed to hear from three panelists who are among the leading minds in financial services, law, and policy, and it's my pleasure to introduce them uh, today. Um, Bert Ely is a financial institutions and monetary policy consultant based in Alexandria, Virginia. He has consulted on deposit insurance and banking issues since 1981. Bert continuously monitors conditions in the banking industry, as well as economic and monetary policy issues. In recent years, he's focused his attention on the resolution of problems in the US financial system, the economic recovery, and the implementation of Dodd-Frank. He consults uh, also to the American Bankers Association on farm credit system issues. Bert established his consulting practice in 1972. He received his MBA from Harvard Business School in 1968 and his bachelor's degree in economics in 1964 from Case Western Reserve University. Michael H. Kriminger is senior counsel with Cleary, Cleary Gottlieb Steen and Hamilton LLP. Prior reti to retiring in April 2020, Mr. Kriminger was a partner whose practice focused on U.S. and international banking and financial institutions. Michael joined Cleary Gottlieb in 2012 after serving for more than two decades in numerous leadership positions with the FDIC, including as deputy to the chairman for policy and general counsel. Thomas P. Vartanian is the executive director of the newly launched Financial Technology and Cybersecurity Center. Over four decades, he chaired the financial institutions practices at two international law firms. Prior to that, he served in the Reagan administration during the SNL crisis as general counsel of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board and the FSLIC. He began his career in the Carter administration as special assistant to the chief counsel of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. His most recent book is 200 Years of American Financial Panics. Crashes, recessions, depressions, and the technology that will change it all. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, we're honored to have you today. I think for the benefit of today's audience, let me level set for a minute um, regarding the subject matter of today's discussion. First, what is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation? It's an independent federal agency created by Congress in 1933 to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. Today, it has four main responsibilities, ensuring bank deposits, examining and supervising state chartered banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve System, making large and complex financial institutions resolvable, and managing receiverships. The FDIC has approximately 5,700 employees and an operating budget, nearly 2.3 billion. By statute, it's to be governed by a five-member board of directors consisting of the comptroller of the currency, the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and three members appointed by the president by and with the advice of the, of the Senate to serve six-year terms. From among these appointees, a chair and vice chair are separately nominated and confirmed with the chair serving a five-year term. By law, not more than three members of the board may be members of the same political party. And if an appointed member's term in office expires, he or she may continue to serve until a successor has been appointed. In recent weeks, FDIC, the FDIC Board of Directors has been convulsed by a widely publicized dispute 
over who controls the agenda of the FDIC board meetings, the board chair, or a majority of its members. Currently, the FDIC board has only four members, Chairperson Yelena McWilliams, Director and former Chairman Martin Grunberg, and serving as ex officio members, Michael Sue, who's the acting controller of the currency, and Rohit Chopra, who's the director of the CFPB. There is one vacancy, that of the vice chairman. Director Grunberg and the two ex officio members, both uh, appointees of, of President Biden, moved to take control of the board agenda, specifically with regard to bank merger policies, which led Chair McWilliams, a Trump appointee, to resign as chairman effective tomorrow, February 4. Mr. Grunberg may likely become the acting chairman of what will be, for the time being, a three-member board. The dispute between McWilliams and the other three directors has raised several issues, not just for the FDIC, but for the other agents, but also for other agencies governed by uh, boards, such as the Federal Reserve, the SEC, the NCUA, and the CFTC. The FDIC is unique, though, with two directors serving at the pleasure of the president and, and who head their own agencies without colleagues who have a vote on their actions. So let's move into our substantive discussion. And Mike, I will turn this over to you first. Before we jump into the you know, the fine details of the present controversy and its implications for the future. What's your perspective on the FDIC's current structure? There's a historical process uh, that has um, brought us to this point in time today in terms of the structure uh, and operation of, of the FDIC. Why is it structured this way? And, and what do you think that means for how the agency conducts its business? Well, thank you very much, Brian. It's a pleasure to appear before the uh, this Federal Society webinar today, and uh, hopefully we can discuss these issues and get a little enlightenment for everyone. Uh, certainly, uh, as Brian pointed out, the FDIC with a five-member board has been really a product of history. If you go back to in the midst of time to the FDIC's creation in 1933 in the Great Depression, the FDIC then had a three-member board which initially consisted until the appointment of the other two of only the comptroller of the currency. So the comptroller of the currency has always been a member of the FDIC board from the initial establishment of the corporation. Uh, then there was a chairman and then a non uh, kind of a, a internal director, if you will, of that three person board. You roll it on up uh, to a more recent history. And as a result of the, uh, the savings and loan crisis, late eighties and early nineties, the FDIC board was expanded to five uh, and at that time, the Office of Thrift Supervision was created uh, and to replace the Federal Savings Loan Insurance Corporation, and the Office of Thrift Supervision became a board member as well. The idea behind that is shown by some of the congressional uh, legislative history was really to kind of have the regulators who are dealing with supervision of financial institutions on the FDIC board, which itself is a regulator, but it's also the deposit insurer, and as you pointed out, the receiver for failed financial uh, insured financial institutions. So the five-member board, you then had the OTS, uh, the comptroller of the currency, a vice chairman, the chairman, and then an internal director who was supposed to have a certain level of uh, state banking uh, supervision experience. And the idea there being to le kind of to level set with all the constituencies that the FDIC was responsible for as a positive insurer and receiver to make sure there's some input. And I would say that over the the uh, you know, effectively, the, the last 30 years of that process, that five-person board, any kind of board, anyone who's participated on boards or advised boards understands that they can be uh, fairly delicate beings, if you will, and you've got to do it. You've got to have a certain skill set to make sure you can balance the various interests. So it's always been a little bit of a challenge because with the OCC on the board, you've got the part of the institution that uh, charters national banks. And it's a chartering authority occasionally, you know, has an interest as does the OTS as well in being a supervisor at that time for uh, savings and loans. You could argue that there is somewhat of a tension between the FDIC's desire to reduce any losses to the FDIC's deposit insurance fund by moving to receivership before those losses get exacerbated versus the ones who are the chartering authorities and primary supervisors for those entities who may be a little bit more reluctant to pull the plug on them and put them into receivership. In my experience, when I was at the FDIC from 91 to 2012, I certainly saw that on a number of occasions. And we saw it during the financial crisis that started in 20, 2007, et cetera, some pressure and tension on that. But I, I personally think that that tension and that debate 
and those uh, disparate responsibilities of board members uh, is a positive feature. I'm a firm believer that the, the idea of a of checks and balances as part of the American system of government is a very important thing and I think does ultimately lead to uh, better results by and large. I would say that even during the financial crisis with all the problems and issues that were there was, and, and well-recognized uh, debates and disputes amongst various parties, uh, having the ability to debate those issues amongst the, at the FKC board level as well as among the various institutions that were responsible for helping deal with the crisis was a better thing than having it driven by a single individual or by, let's say, the Secretary of the Treasury as the dominant authority because it gave interest of a deposit insurer receiver the ability to speak. It had the interest of the OCC comptroller and you had the interest of the OTS or the thrift supervisor. Of course, then when Dodd-Frank was adopted, uh, the OTS went away, uh, was dissolved, and uh, and the its place on the FTC board was put in place by the for the director of the uh, Consumer Financial Products Bureau, uh, which is has less of the uh, I'll call it old-fashioned supervisory responsibilities than do uh, the OCC and the FDIC. So it's a little different of an entity, but certainly those other entities are responsible also for consumer protection. So there's a bit uh, of an issue of a bit of a coalescence there. One thing I would note too is looking, you know, looking at the time when it was very, um, when there was a lot of controversy about issues at the FDIC board level back in 2006, uh, when Sheila Bayer took off, took office as chairman of the FDIC, and I was at that time a senior advisor to her, there was a very extensive process put in place then about how to deal with client uh, desires for more information by board members and board deputies, and we spent a lot of time reviewing the uh, bylaws. Uh, it was a, there was a great debate about a provision of the bylaw now, which is in Article 6, Section 4, which says that the chairman has the general powers and duties normally vested in the office of a senior uh, of a chief executive officer in corporations, uh, and then what would be the authority of various board members. There was a lot of debate about what information they should get. We put in a more formalized process in 2006 to provide information to deputies, make sure the information flowed, and how those different interests could be balanced, which Thank God we did it in 2006 before we were in a time of war in 2007 and 8. So uh, just fortuitous chance on that one, but it worked out pretty well. And then so the bylaws now uh, define in uh, Article 6 about the various responsibilities of the various um, uh, executive officers of the corporation, including the chairman, general counsel, et cetera. And then in Article 4 of the bylaws of the FDIC, uh, particularly in Section 6, it defines the various roles of the uh, of the various parties to in the meetings of the board. So in Article uh, uh, six, Article 4, Section 6A, the chairman normally calls the meetings, is responsible for, for putting in place the meetings and generating, uh, you know, putting the, the meetings in form. Uh, Section 6B gives board members, however, the chance to call special meetings, whatever that may be. It's not defined in the bylaws. Uh, and then in Section 6G, it also gives the uh, board the opportunity to make decisions and resolve issues by written uh, consent, by written votes, and that's been used quite extensively. Probably, if I were making a comparison between the various uh, chairmen, probably Chairman McWilliams has probably used the, the uh, written consent uh, board meetings a little bit more frequently than prior uh, chairmen have. Um, I know that there has you know, been some debates at the board level at the FDIC about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And those debates extend back long before McWilliams' uh, tenure. So um, that's certainly some of the authorities uh, that the board has to be able to deal with various issues. And obviously, we can get into uh, you know, how, how those apply, what they should be applied, how they should be done, et cetera. But certainly, I would say, just to put on the table, that the bylaws were not intended to create a situation where the chairman would refused to take up issues that were of concern by various board members. The special meetings provision was put in place in part uh, to allow for board members to set up a meeting on something that they wanted to have discussed, even if the chair it wasn't on the chairman's agenda. However, as I've mentioned in others, Bora, uh, I'm incredibly uh, sympathetic to uh, Yellen and Williams' concerns about making sure that issues that are issued for the FDIC for public comment or for any other purpose are fully vetted through the FDIC. Like any board, I will simply say that I think the management of the board concerns and stresses that inevitably can be there because you, by definition, have 
members from two different parties that may have two different goals, may have multiple goals that are different from each other, and the responsibility of running their own agency, I think, while a benefit, can lead to stresses and strains that uh, require a lot of um, uh, dip- diplomacy and diplomatic skill to resolve. I'm not putting any blame on anyone in this. I think this is a very unfortunate circumstance to occur. Um, uh, whether it could have been resolved without uh, it coming to this pass, I don't know. But uh, certainly that's been a big focus of Chairman in the past, and I'm sure he ought to Williams as well, is trying to deal with the stress and the strains of a complex board. But uh, I would just note that I think the FDIC board has by and large worked amicably much better than the boards of some other agencies uh, that uh, seem to always divide exclusively along uh, partisan lines. Uh, the FDIC board has not really been that way uh, historically. So I'll turn it back to you, Brian. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Tom and, and Bert for a response. We did bleed a little bit into uh, what I think is the, the next um, logical kind of topic of, of discussion here, which is, you know, what precipitated the present, you know, crisis or the present clash uh, on the board. And that was, you know, just to lay the factual predicate, um, an announcement on the CFPB website indicating that the FDIC board had authorized the issuance of a request for information seeking public comment on um, the Bank Merger Act. And that uh, act, uh, or I guess that announcement was announced by Mr. Groomberg and Mr. Chopra, but not Mr. Sue uh, of the OCC. And that announcement drew a swift rebuke from the FDIC, which issued a separate press release on its site saying that the board had not in fact authorized the issuance of the F- or of the RFI because it had not gone through the FDIC process for uh, drafting and then subsequently approving the issuance of the RFI by the board. So that was that was factually what transpired just a couple of weeks ago. And then <clears throat> from there, uh, there was, um, uh, pr- I guess, presumably legal analysis that had been released by the CFPB to three news outlets, which um, shed light at least on the arguments that the CFPB director was making for the authority of the majority of the board to bring matters um, to uh, the board for a vote during board meetings. Um, There was an FDIC board meeting in which uh, Mr. Chopra did try and raise the issue for board consideration and the chair uh, rebuffed him. So um, that that was uh, kind of the, the confluence of events that led to the nature of this legal dispute. You know, Mike, you raised uh, you know, issues relating to the bylaws and the, the internal governance of the FDIC. But at this point, I'd like to turn it over to um, Tom. We'll start with you and then I'll turn to Bert um, for uh, your thoughts on uh, present events, um, legal or otherwise. And, uh, and, and, and then I think after that, we'll turn to what we see in terms of short-term and long-term implications for the agency. Right. Thanks, Brian. Um, And uh, Mike, thanks for your comments. I want to dovetail off those a little bit. Uh, But just a little bit of background. Uh, I was both counselor to the uh, uh, controller at the Office of Control of the Currency and then general counsel of the bank board. So I I saw in a period of seven, eight years how to deal with both of those different organizations. Uh, With the controller, John Hyman was the one I worked the most with. He basically walked into his office, had a discussion, senior staff was there, and then he signed a regulation. You know, it was extraordinarily efficient. Not that a lot of work didn't go into it, but it was extraordinarily efficient. When you have a board, as Mike well knows, there's a lot of care and feeding for all the people to make them integral to the process, to make them feel like they are part of the process, to give them their say, to compromise. And that can take as much as six months going back and forth. So you're you're talking about something that can be done in a few days or a few weeks, uh, being turned into a much larger process because there's a board. Now, you can argue whether that's good or bad. I know what the, everybody knows what the arguments for and against are. On the one side is efficiency, on the other side is sort of getting input from both sides, from both parties, from all different aspects and funneling them in to get a better decision. And, and the question I always ask myself when I was at the board is, we, are we getting a better decision or are we getting a, a three-humped camel? You know, because that's 
that could be well, either one of those could be the result of that process. So I'm going to go now to the question you raised about uh, mergers to make another point, but I want to come back at the end to the structural issue. Uh, and that is, you know, uh, what we heard is this was about the merger of banks in the United States and banking policy and merger policy. Um, well, I, I think that's sort of uh, uh, artificial because uh, I don't remember the last time the FDIC was involved in, in large bank mergers. If we're talking about the concern over the consolidation of banking in this country, the FDIC looks after and, and decides a lot of community bank mergers, but I don't know that they, you know, I, I don't remember them when I was practicing being involved in a lot of the big bank mergers, which are most people are concerned about from a consolidation point of view, from a public policy point of view. So if, if, we're, if we're saying that this is all about whether community banks should be merging or not, I, I'd be shocked if that was really the issue, frankly. And you know, when I started in 1976 at the controller's office, there were 28,000 national ba banks and savings and loans in this country. We're down to about 5,000, right? So if, if you've missed that, that trend, you're really not paying attention that the business is getting smaller and smaller and more efficient every day and more consolidated every day. And I, I'm not sure that, uh, that we're gonna stop that, but I don't think this issue is about merger policy in the United States. I think it could be about whether to serve meatloaf or green beans in the cafeteria and it'd be the same thing. It's about people who aren't getting along trying to figure out how to, how to uh, you know, bring it to a head. And, what Mike said, I think, is, is very important in terms of uh, working with the board. And that is most of these issues in a board context get resolved behind closed doors. People work very hard to get them resolved behind closed doors. Uh, sometimes the chairman has to exert some influence. Uh, there was an epic, there was a story in the 1980s about one director of the FDIC who had his office confiscated from him and put into a very small office because of his, uh, you know, obstreperous behavior. And, and the chairman's got that authority. The chairman's got the executive and the administrative authority. But as Mike suggests, the ultimate here, the ultimate bottom line is that the statute says the board runs the FDIC at the end of the day because they vote. They can vote on anything. And if they can vote on anything, you go back to what, um, a, uh, a congressman told me in 1981 when I was brand new in Washington, and he said, kid, if you're going to be successful in this town, you got to know how to count noses, right? And it's all about counting votes, uh, whether you got the votes or you don't have the votes. And so, look, you know, you can, you can play this any one of a number of ways. And this could have been this, I mean, the chairman has enough power to sort of make things ugly for the other directors and the directors can make things ugly for the chairman. Question is, is that what people want to be doing? People generally don't like confrontation. As Mike suggested, I, I spent 20 years doing takeovers, hostile takeovers in the banking world in the 80s and 90s when they were sort of in vogue, particularly with the savings and loans. And, you know, this stuff happens every day in a boardroom. It just looks a little different when it's in a regulatory agency, but there's not a day that goes by that this stuff doesn't happen in a boardroom and you as a lawyer have to deal with it and try to figure out how to solve these problems. And at the end of the day, in a corporate boardroom, the numbers always decide the case. And it's either the stock price is one set of numbers or the votes you have be, uh, behind you. But it's always going to be that that you've got to be focused on in terms of drawing a, a practical solution here. So. I take from this that, that one, I, I don't really think there's an issue here. I think this is real life playing out at the, at the FDIC like it does in every other corporate boardroom in America. Uh, and I don't know that there's any precedent to draw from this, but I sort of step back a little bit. And one, one thing I thought about, and, and Mike, I don't know if you thought about this, I'm not even sure how you run a coup at an agency anymore with the Sunshine Act, you know, because the directors aren't supposed to be talking to each other <laughs> uh, without without sunshining a meeting. So, um, you know, there's that aspect of it, too. But, you know, what I come back to at the bottom line here, and I talk about this in my book an awful lot, what I come back to is what's the right answer in this kind of stuff for public policy? What's the right public policy answer? 
what's the right amount of money we should be spending of the taxpayers' money? And I and I and it's, it's this stuff like this says to me, does this make sense that we're worried about and fighting about and spending money and time over a bunch of directors fighting? Now, this may be an exclamation point on the continuing politicization of the banking agencies, which I think is a very bad thing. I think as far as I've known from the very beginning, um, money is green. It's not red or blue, right? And that takes a certain expertise. It takes a certain experience to make sure we have the right regulatory people. But at the end of the day, to have people fighting in the boardroom about this stuff, I don't think is, is, is what we really need or want from the, from the point of view of efficiency. Uh, and so I have my own particular perspective on the, on the structure of the FDIC. I don't know why the CFPB director is there and not the vice chair of the Fed or the chairman of the SEC, because they are more intimately involved in what banks are doing than, than the CFPB in terms of the safety and soundness side. But look, Congress did what it did. And, 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 and the bottom line question I sort of focus on is, why do we need these kinds of, uh, of distractions? Uh, would it be better if the FDIC were single-headed? Uh, would that make more sense? Uh, and so, um, you know, and I do think we need to depoliticize these banking agencies. I think that's a very, very uh, disastrous trend. And one of the things I spoke uh, in my book about over the last 200 years is how many times politicizing economics and finance had caused negative reactions in the marketplace and perverse sort of circumstances to produce financial crisis. So those are my thoughts. And I, I, I really look forward to, to getting into some of these issues with, uh, with Bert and Mike. Thanks, Tom. Let me turn it over to Bill, to Bert here. I, w- one quick observation. You, I think you raise a very interesting point about how under the Bank Merger Act, it's the OCC that has responsibility over combinations that result in you know, the entity being a national bank, which tend to be the larger banks. And it's the FDIC that has responsibility for combinations that result in, in a state chartered uh, non-member bank. And it occurs to me that the OCC on its own authority under the acting control of the currency has existing authority to issue an RFI uh, regarding a review of the Bank Merger Act, but elected not to do, do so in this circumstance and instead joined uh, Mr. Grunberg and Mr. Chopra in uh, seeking to issue the RFI under the auspices and authority of the FDIC. So an, yeah. an interesting, development there. Bert, why don't I turn it over to you? There's been a lot of discussion so far. We'd love to hear your perspective. First of all, excuse me. Um, you got some feedback there. Yeah, no, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure what that, my apologies. I think you need to mute uh, either one of your phone or your uh, computer. Okay, let's try that. Um, I'm sure what is see if that's better yeah that's better um okay i i think that uh the, the merger issue just happens to be the issue that brought things to a head i think the uh the thing that's unique about the fdic is i've looked at the other federal agencies and as that you have on a five-member board, you have two ex officios. As I, uh, I haven't done a thorough review of this, but as I look at other independent uh, regulatory bodies, uh, not just uh, uh, in financial services, you don't find ex officio members. In other words, someone is a member of a board, and that's the only federal position uh, that they have. And so the directors are all, uh, you know, truly independent for the for the period of their their term of office. But here at the FDIC, you have, number one, two ex officios on a five-member board. But then also at this uh, uh, point in time, uh, uh, you had a uh, uh, one vacancy on the board. And with McWilliams uh, leaving, you're going to have uh, two vacancies on the board. So it effectively, the ex officios uh, are in a, who are presidential appointees are in a position to uh, control things. So my sense is that while the merger issue is what kind of ex- caused things to explode. The, the really fundamental problem uh, that continues, and that is the, the, the relatively, I believe, unique structure 
of the FDIC board in terms of who uh, who serves on it. And my understanding is that some legislation has just been introduced to, to address this issue. I don't know the specifics of it, but it's something that I think we ought to uh, uh, consider. There's also another issue, uh, and that is that at the moment with McWilliams gone, you will then have uh, uh, three directors. And um, uh, uh, Marty Gruenberg, who will probably be the acting chairman, and then the two ex officios. And might the administration want to kind of keep things that way uh, indefinitely and not fill the other two slots on the FDIC board so that uh, it there is more of a, shall we say, a political influence, uh, if you will, driving FDIC uh, policy making and its position on, on regulations? And if that's the case, is that good or is that really? Uh, uh, a big negative for banking regulation going forward. So I'll leave it there. Bert, if I could just, could I just uh, make a couple of comments on that? I think it was, I think what Tom and Bert said, I agree with a lot. I, where I may differ a little bit with Bert is I do think there's a value, as I th think I said in my earlier remarks, a value to having uh, ex officio uh, members on the board, as well as uh, from, you know, from um, say background on state regulatory authority, et cetera, because of the, unique nature of what the FDIC does. I also uh, made point this point, which I do believe to be the case, because I've thought for a long time about why is it the FDIC board usually in the past, up until this point, always has, um, I'll call it uh, uh, frank and intense debates, but has usually worked pretty well as a matter of comedy. It's almost like the process, if you will, of the board has been one of uh, we'll come to an agreement eventually. We may debate it in detail. And at times, you've had the comptroller taking a different view than the FDIC board, and the comptroller you know, would, might vote against what the FDIC board's doing, or et cetera. But I do think that having other uh, agencies on that board uh, helps the FDIC in coordinating on supervision of national banks. Uh, and in fact, there was even, even some discussion uh, during Dodd Frank of having a, a Fed board member or the Fed uh, vice chairman or something like that be part of the FDIC board as well to help coordinate that process too. And there are a variety of reasons why that may may not and was not uh, appropriate at the time. It was not done. But I think having um, at the time we had the OTS and the OCC board, it allowed uh, on the FDIC board during the crisis, it allowed for debates about how to deal with troubled thrifts and how to deal with troubled uh, national banks that would have not been as informed, I don't think, had they not been on the board. Were there disagreements? Absolutely. In fact, it's well known there were very active disagreements with the OTS director, John Rich, at the time about issues related to, to thrifts. There were certainly similar active debates with John Dugan about the, the comptroller's responsibilities under the, with the OCC. But I think having those debates on the board level were actually fairly helpful on your point, Bert, about uh, a shorthanded board, I do think that's a problem. Um, the Trump administration also didn't fill certain uh, positions at a number of agencies, including on the FDIC board. I was concerned about that then. I would be concerned about it if the Biden administration does the same thing, because I think having a more politicized vi uh, view or politicized perspective in some ways at the FDIC is almost the most dangerous because the FDIC has got to have to be the receiver. It has the authority to close banks. It has the authority to supervise, to be back of a supervisory authority for all these banks. You would hate to see that becoming a becoming even a perception by anyone that that was being driven by political concerns, which I think is why it's very important to have a, a, a bipartisan board at the FDIC and not have it be a, a rump board that can be driven by the party that's in presidential power. Mike, you know, I'm, I'm certainly going to agree with you. And uh, uh, as one who has sat through uh, a number of uh, FDIC board meetings in the audience, I, I appreciate everything you're saying in terms of debate. But the key thing is that you then basically had uh, a full board of all five members or, you know, maybe there would be one vacancy. But we now have this, this very unusual uh, uh, situation, which I think has re revealed, if you will, a structural flaw in the board. Uh, and whether or not that gets fixed either by filling the board out or uh, through some kind of legislative action, uh, what has happened is we're now seeing the structural problem and the question is what's gonna be the best way to work it out going forward and how soon will it get resolved? Or are we going to be in for several years at least of 
uh, potential divisions like this within between the outside directors and the board and and, and the FDIC itself. I, I think that I think this, I, I do agree. I think there's a significant issue about uh, we've seen that in the past. We've seen three member boards. They've tended in the further past have tended to be some bipartisan element on the three member boards in the past. Uh, under President Trump, there were periods in which it was a, a three to one ratio. Uh, now it would be a three zero, if you will, ratio. And I don't think that's a good thing. Well, that's a good segue into our next topic here, which is what are, what, let's prognosticate a little bit. What are the short-term implications for the board? And, and Bert, you and Mike have both discussed some of these, which is as of tomorrow, we'll have a three member board, two ex officio and one acting chair. Uh, there's normally a you know nominations process that would take place to fill the vacated or empty seats. It's not lost on anyone that we're in a midterm uh, election cycle shortly um, and congressional midterm elections. I wouldn't uh, care to handicap the outcome of those elections, but um, there has been you know, an immediate response with statements made by members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. There was a, a bill introduced to you know, uh, deal with the structure in terms of service of the FDIC board members. So there's already been some response, but what do you all see I guess both internal to the FDIC moving forward and how it conducts its business and also external in terms of the response of Congress and, and perhaps others as the short-term implications of, of this event and the, and the chair's resignation. Well, I, I would note, I'll add one thing uh, on that, if I might, Brian. We, we've certainly seen uh, situations in the, in the past where there was um, a kind of a, uh, a convoy system for nominations being approved so that you would have a, a Democratic and a Republican representative uh, who would be on the FDIC board, they would kind of be approved jointly. That kind of broke down over the last number of years. It would be nice in some ways if there could be that type of, that level of bipartisanship at some point where there would be a, a Republican member who come on the board as vice chairman, let's say, uh, and a Democrat come on the board as chairman under uh, President Biden, so that you would have more of a balance. I, th I think, it, to my prior point, I just, I'll stop there. I think having a sole party control of the FDIC is not a good thing. But let me uh, just, uh, uh, to follow up on your, your, your point there, Mike, the FDIC cannot have more than three members of the same political party on the board. Right. And I believe right. that uh, all three of the current members would uh, have to be um, our, our Democrats. So, it, you know, if there were two more put on the board to fill the vacancies, they would, my understanding is that both have to be Republicans or, or independents. And so then the question rises, can you have, a, the, does the convoy system work where both of them would be, both of the uh, uh, nominees would be, uh, re, be Republicans? That might be harder to accomplish. Well, you might, you might, I think the way I would view that is because Marty Greenberg's term has already expired. You need someone to replace him or be, to become chairman because technically there's not a chairman. Because that's like, as you know, a separate approval, we're getting really in the, base, in the weeds here, but that's a separate approval to be chairman. It has a different term even. But I would vision it being someone as chairman than the two Republicans would be part of the convoy system. I, in in old, former days, you could say, okay, that could happen. I'm not so sure right now. <laughs> And that raises an interesting question, which is the, the politics of the situation right now. Uh, assuming for the sake of argument that the president were to renominate Mr. Groomberg as, say, the chair of the FDIC in a 50 50 split Senate, it's not a foregone conclusion that confirmation would occur uh, given the razor thin margins um, it would take to discharge a nominee out of the banking committee and then subsequently confirm through a floor vote. Yeah, that's yeah, why know, we need to have that Republican convoy <laughs> to get it, that it, through. You know, Brian, I think the, the short-term implications of this is that uh, it might be this status quo for some time. I mean, you can go back in the banking business and look at this kind of thing, you know, the disappearance of directors happening and seats not being filled for a year or two at a time. I yeah. mean, it's just, uh, it's just not a process that's going to happen overnight. Uh, and Marty Grunberg's a known commodity. I mean, he was chair. He's been at the board for how many years? You know, I mean, he's a known commodity. So I don't think this is going to be viewed as a crisis, apart from 
people sort of creating a crisis out of what is sort of a, a, a normal event in every corporate boardroom. But uh, so I think, you know, we could see this as the situation for some time to come. I don't think this president's going to be in a rush uh, to change the situation. He's got his hands full with so many other problems right now. Uh, the Senate's got its hands full. So when those when when those kinds of circumstances arise in the past, we've seen him hang on for those things happen, you know, sort of drag along for months and months, if not years. Tom, Tom and I think I agree with you on that uh, on that point. Uh, I think the only thing that would um, you know maybe accelerate action is if there was a future flap uh, on on the board. But assuming that things calm down, uh, I think we could continue with the status quo for easily another year or two. Well, I tend to agree. And one thing I would note on that is that the um, we continue with the status quo for another year or two. I think it's a broader problem we have in government. We've had a great deal of difficulty of getting confirmed nominee or nominees confirmed for a number of agencies. Um, you've got the acting comptroller of the currency. Uh, you've got uh, an acting chairman of the FDIC. We we need to get back into the position where we confirm. I even think it's a question to talk about constitutional issues when you're requiring Senate confirmation and you got people running the government who've never been presented to the Senate for confirmation. That was under the prior administration or this administration so far. Uh, and I think we need to get away from that. That's not the way the system is designed to work. One other factor, I guess, to consider or to seek your feedback on is, you know, who knows what the outcome of the midterm elections are. But let's assume, again, for the sake of argument, that the change of control or change of power in one or the other uh, houses changes. That, of course, means that the gavels transfer hands to the other party and subpoena authority and oversight of agencies comes with that. And, you know, historically, oversight is more vigorous when you have one party in Congress controlling uh, subpoena power and the other party running an agency. You think that this incident increases the likelihood that should, you know, there be a change in control of either the House or the Senate in less than a year's time, uh, that the FDIC itself uh, would be subject to heightened scrutiny as a, as a consequence of this event. I think there's certainly a very high likelihood of that. That's why it kind of goes back to a point I made some time ago, and I think the others agree with, is that the um, you need a you need to have someone in the chairman's office who is good at working across the aisle. Uh, you know, Sheila was not perfect, and in, in, but I think she did a fabulous job at working well across the aisle. She had very strong relationships with with Republicans because she herself is a Republican, uh, very strong relationships with those on the Republican side of the aisle, the Senate and the House, as well as on the Democratic side. And that made things work much better, I think, and able to get uh, things approved at the FDIC board level because there was uh, the newest political support on both sides. If you end up with a sole party at the FDIC, I can see that heightened scrutiny, let's say, if the, the House or the Senate changes uh, party control uh, would definitely be an exacerbated issue. And I think the worst possible thing for the U.S. banking market is if you end up having the creation of an impression by bankers or the public at large that the bank regulation is being run entirely through a political process of whether that, you know, whether you create a certain um, aura about that process through these, you know, uh, gotcha type investigations, which occasionally occur in Congress or you end up having that in fact occur. Uh, let me just jump in with a, a, a question that relates to what you were uh, just saying, Mike, and that is, let's assume for the moment that this, uh, the present status quo continues for a period of time. How's that going to affect the ability of the FDIC to work with the other federal financial regulators? Because obviously there has to be close coordination on a number of issues, including with regard to, to rulemaking. So I'd be interested in what your sense and uh, Tom's also as to uh, how this is going to affect the FDIC's working relationship with the other financial regulators and specifically uh, the comptroller and the Fed. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... Please go ahead, Tom. I was going to let you go first anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was just going to say quickly, I, I don't see any I, I don't see any real impact, frankly. I mean, the one thing that's always been great about the regulators is whoever's there, whoever's running the shop, they work together. They do what they have to do because they know their job. I mean, they they understand safety and soundness. This has nothing to do with safety and soundness of the banking system or systemic stability, right? Which are the, the key points 
that we ought to be thinking about from a public policy point of view. But I think, Bert, I think it has, you know, very little impact on, on the working what relationship. Regard, what about with regard to rulemaking, which is where you can get some differences of, of, of between the agencies? Is that well, look, I mean, my, my, yeah, but my, my experience is that the agencies bump heads all the time and they work it out. I mean, yeah. these agencies are always fighting for turf and jurisdiction and press releases and, you know, acclamation. I mean, it's not like they're walking down the aisle singing Kumbaya all the time. You know, there's a lot of head knocking going on there. And that'll continue, I think, in, 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 yeah. in the real world. And I think I think, frankly, as I said before, I think it's kind of a healthy thing in some ways. You like to have the competition of different ideas. I mean, the OCC has the responsibilities for national banks. The Federal Reserve has responsibility for overall stability, the bank holding company system, and uh, all the other aspects of monetary policy, what the Fed does. The FDIC has receivership supervision, backup supervision in many cases, and uh, deposit insurance. They come with different interests, which is going to lead to some degree of uh, headbutting, what, no matter what the parties are. If we had to say, for example, in a hypothetical, counterfactual hypothetical, with Yellen staying in office, and you had a Democratic comptroller and a Democratic head of the CFPB, you, you, as we saw in this example, you might see more headbutting. But those are the types of things in which we've seen in the past, the ability to get along and the ability to resolve issues. And I would point out, I think it's relevant in that context, if you look at Michael Hughes' uh, failure to join the press release by Marty Grunberg and Chopra, he has responsibility for running his own agency. I have seen in un innumerable situations where the comptroller like put the gloves on or didn't say things about what was going at the FDIC and kind of kept quiet about them because he had to run his he or she had to run that own their own agency and the FDIC had to run that agency and they were conscious of how difficult that is that's one of the reasons frankly having other agency heads on the FDIC board can be beneficial because they understand what it's like I'm not just spending all day and I don't mean any disparagement to the SEC board members, commissioners, but I'm not just spending all day focusing on what battles I'm fighting at the SEC. I'm focusing on also how do I run my own agency? That makes a difference and leavens the debate a little bit. Yeah, we saw we sort of backed in, uh, Brian, backed into an issue that I hinted at at the beginning. So I'm going to come back to it. And that is from a public policy point of view. I, I finally concluded after 45 years of doing what I have done is that the regulatory structure is so just so redundant and inefficient. It's just, it just needs to be redone. I mean, it was set up in the 1930s. There's nothing about today's economy from a fintech or economic or financial point of view that looks like the 1930s. And, you know, we've just got to do something about having so many regulatory eyes look at every movement by every financial institution and sort of ignore everybody else who has their fingers in the financial pie, but aren't banks, right? We right. regulate only banks. We don't regulate financial activities. And as fintechs are showing us, that's insane. It's just completely insane because now what we're doing is banks are now about 35% of the financial market. They used to be 100% in the 1930s, about 35%. So what we're doing is we're forcing all the high risk out to places where it isn't regulated, as we saw in the 2008 crisis. And so, look, I mean, when, if you're a nationwide lender in this country and you have a bank holding company in a bank, um, for you to turn on the lights every day, you've got to satisfy about 165 regulators, federal and state regulators at a minimum. 165 regulators can look over your shoulder. All the states, all their consumer regulators, all their SEC regulators, all the state commissioners, the attorneys general are all looking to be governors of their states. I mean, that's an awful lot of regulatory oversight to deal with. And at some point, and I think this sort of this sort of bubbles that issue up in terms of in terms of what happened at the FDIC. I mean, why do we have so many people doing so many of the same things at the same time and then fighting for jurisdiction and fighting for, you know, for the role that uh, that they think they should have? It just doesn't make any sense. Tom, I, I, I I'm going to. Uh... I agree with you on that point, but you know we've had this kind of debate going on for decades. Uh, for all the time that those on this call have been in, in Washington, and the, my question is: to, is what's going to make it change? 
uh, I just don't see it as, as bad as the situation is. I just don't see it uh, changing uh, in any way. We have a basically a paralysis that has set in, but I don't see what's going to uh, loosen things up. Maybe you yeah. guys. I, I do think I, I do think what, what's going to get it to change is technology, because technology is going to make such enormous changes with our artificial intelligence, 5G and the Internet of Things and the way it's going to affect the creation of financial products and the delivery of financial products. And who's going to be doing that? We're going to be facing a, a, an existential problem here because the banks aren't going to have a business left if we keep regulating the way we're regulating. And that's going to be an enormous problem uh, to deal with. And so I do think the technology is the trigger here. It may be only after there's, there's some sort of crisis, but I think technology is changing the financial world so dramatically that you know, that's going to be the trigger to change. Tom, so maybe, I, I would say, maybe a stick of dynamite. <laughs> yeah, Tom, Tom and Bert, I would say I, I, I share your concern, but I come at it from a different perspective. And because sort of my point earlier, I don't have as much problem if you have a limited number of regulators that deal with banking, you know, central bank, chartering authority at the national level and a deposit insurer. I actually think that having those separate allows for a better, more leavened debate. Uh, I've seen what happens in Europe when all three of those are combined in a single institution. That doesn't necessarily work either. I think what the problem is in some ways is that because we have this regulatory system for banking um, and we have one for securities and commodities, we tend to slot everything into those three categories. And so that you've got things in fintech, for example, to your point, which I totally agree with, that are very much in banking and securities and commodities in some ways. They need to be regulated in some fashion that makes sense, but we tend to want to regulate them as if they are securities brokers, commodities dealers, and banks. They may not be any of the three. You could argue they're doing some of the functions of one right. of the three, but I think it's I, I'm not a big fan of, for example, the proposal to make sure that any kind of stable coin, for example, is issued out of a bank. What makes me think that banks are necessarily going to do that better? It means I've got a regulatory, it's because I've got a regulatory system that regulates banks. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way of dealing with some of the fintech or some of the other financial innovations we've seen. And I, I think I, I think always re-looking at the system we have uh, makes a lot of sense. If anything didn't emphasize the risk of non-banks, the financial crisis was certainly it. But what did we do in response to that? We regulated banks. And we yeah. have areas in, in Dodd-Frank that are supposed to deal with non-bank risk, but because of the pushback of all those non-bank actors, everything ended up devolving on regulating it like regulating banks. And that was my concern at the very beginning when Dodd-Frank was passed. I remember telling somebody now the biggest challenge would be to actually make sure we apply some of these things to the non-banks instead of just regulating what we already know how to regulate. But, but Mike, as you know, uh, this kind of leads into the issue of uh, other proposals to consolidate the regulatory agencies, and that certainly hasn't gone into play. So my sense is that at least for the foreseeable future, we're kind of well, st we're stuck with the regulatory structure uh, that well, we have, and all of the parties of interest uh, who who want to uh, maintain that because that's what they know how to influence. Yeah. Right. Well, let well, me they, let they, me they, ask the group this then, in in terms <laughs> of you know Bert. It, it, uh, just a, a follow on question based on your observation that maybe things won't change. It, you know, we are living now in the post Supreme Court Sela law world where, you know, the structure of the CFPB, you know, uh, sole director structure, but an independent regulatory agency like the rest of the financial regulators was challenged on separation of powers grounds. And the Supreme Court's opinion, in, in my view, effectively said, Humphrey's executor is now cabined and kind of in a corner, unclear whether uh, you know, any agency could avail itself of the general exception under Humphrey's to Myers, which is, is effectively a holding that you know, heads of agencies should serve at the pleasure of the president so that he can faithfully execute the law. So there's at least a question in my mind, but uh, would love to hear your thoughts on whether or not you know, this type of controversy at FDIC or this type of stasis at other independent financial regulatory agencies is likely to draw a challenge on the basis of sale law. And, you know, presumably if that type of 
uh, case were to go up to the Supreme Court, you might have uh, you know, a variety of outcomes. One could potentially be that Humphreys is not just placed in the corner, but completely overturned. That was you know, Justice Thomas's dissenting opinion, uh, in part, in, in the Salo Law decision. So um, you know, it could be that you know, in answer to your question, Bert, or at least for, for consideration by the group, that the Supreme Court might have a say on this matter on separation of powers grounds. Well, I think that that is a, a very important point that, in, in effect, it, it may come down to the courts and the Supreme Court to kind of shake things loose uh, in terms of how the financial sector has been regulated. And that might force Congress to to take some uh, action. But even then, that's not going to happen very quickly because of all the competing interests that are going to be fighting over whatever Congress tries to do. I, I would I agree with you, Brian, that um, the current state of the law uh, on presidential appointments and the authority of independent agencies is certainly up in the air. And I'm, I don't have a great deal of um, distinctions to make between some of the recent decisions and some of the boards that are out there as well. Uh, but it does raise, in my mind, at least the, the question kind of, you probably can speculate, you probably can assume what I'm going to say here in this way, it does raise in my mind the difference between sometimes what might be the legal analysis even at a constitutional level, and what might be wise policy. I think it would be very unwise policy for the direction of financial uh, operations, financial regulation, and bank regulation at the federal level to be quite so uh, determined by the politics of the party and the executive branch so that there's this feeling that I fear of uh, that, that, that the decisions and the uh, the safety and soundness of institutions is perceived as being some ways a political decision rather than one on the merits. Because I've, I've done a lot of international work over the years, and I've seen many countries, legion, if you will, that that has been a serious problem and has continued to be an issue for the financial sector. So we have to make sure that everything that's done in the U.S. financial regulatory regime uh, re realm complies with the Constitution, but we need to at least see that there could be some, we need to find a way of dealing with it in a way that still provides for what I think is a better policy of having a little bit of independence from pure political direction on some of these decisions. I do want to interject here. I see our time is running short, unfortunately, but I want to give each of you a minute for closing thoughts or additional analysis. Bert, would you like to start? Okay. Um, you know, I think that um, uh, we're in a situation with the FDIC where uh, it's going to continue to be you know, somewhat in limbo in terms of uh, what the makeup of the board is going to be and uh, the direction it takes. And so I think that uh, uh, we just have to accept the fact that nothing of significance is going to change uh, over the, at least the next uh, few years. And that, of course, is going to raise a whole set of uh, policy issues that are going to give us plenty to talk about over the next couple of years. Tom? Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll uh, sort of finish where I started, and that is I think that uh, the, the FDIC controversy here is, is sort of a, a symbol, or if not a, a bubbling up of the, uh, of the political situation in the country. And, and that is sort of the defiance back and forth and the, and the fighting back and forth. And uh, to the extent that kind of politics and politicization of the banking business continues, it is going to create very difficult circumstances and it's going to lead to financial crisis. There's no doubt about it in my mind. I mean, this is, this is an issue that we've really got to come to grips with and our leaders on the Hill have got to come to grips with and we've got to find some adults to sort of regulate money as money, not as politics. Thanks, Mike. Uh, the one thing I would say in closing is I've kind of laid out my views on a number of the issues. I would just note that uh, I agree with what Tom and Bert both said. There, it, we do need to deal with these issues in a, in a, in a professional way, in a nonpartisan way or bipartisan way. Not, there's no such thing as nonpartisan, bipartisan way uh, to the extent possible for exactly the reasons that, that Tom laid out. And I would just note as an inside baseball uh, issue with regards to the function of the regulatory agencies, it goes back to a prior point I've made. My view when I was at the FJC for as long as I was is that the FJC was much more effective in advancing both its views and doing the public's job when it had confirmed chairman, vice chairman, and board members. 
And I think the same is true for other agencies. And I think we've got to move back to confirming people rather than having acting. Agreed. Well, with that, I will wrap this. Thanks to, to each of the three of you for your participation today. This was an excellent discussion. Uh, it was an honor to help moderate this debate. Um, wish it could go longer, uh, and maybe we'll have to reschedule round two. Um, but Brian, with that, I will thanks turn to you, this Brian. over to Evelyn. Thank yeah, you very thank much. Thank you very much, all. Thanks, Brian and Evelyn. Thanks so much, everybody. I'll just chime in with adding the thanks of the Federalist Society to our excellent speakers, to our excellent moderator, and also to our audience for tuning in and participating. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. So if you have any questions or critiques, please send them to that email address. Um, please keep an eye on your emails and our website for upcoming virtual events. And without further ado, we are adjourned. Have a good afternoon. Thanks.